take our Bibles this morning and turn to John uh, chapter 16. John chapter 16, and I'm going to start here, and then we're going to kind of springboard off of this passage of Scripture. But I want to welcome you to the final um, sermon, if you will, for our Fear Not series. And we've covered some ground in the four weeks that we've looked at this topic, and we've talked through some challenging ideas, uh, not the least of which is the idea that we can be victorious in our battle against fear. How many have ever been frozen by fear? Right? How many of us have ever been in a situation that you couldn't control and you fretted or you worried about it or you became obsessed with the burden of like, I don't know what to do in this situation. I think all of us have been there. And my goal through this series was to share with us what the Bible says about anxiety, about worry, and about being fearful when it comes to how we react to God and how we react to these situations and what we should do with that fear that we have. And you know, there's a lot of fear mongering in our world today. Our governments are doing it, TV does it. You know, if you don't buy this latest, greatest thing, you're gonna miss out. How many of you are afraid to miss out on something? And you know what? They jerk at our fears. They, they, they make us anxious. They make us worry. You know, if you don't have enough retirement, one day you're going to retire and you're not going to live the life that you could live. And, and all these things. And I mentioned I'm not upset about insurance. I'm not anti-insurance. I have insurance. Um, so, but on the flip side of victory that one experiences at times we're defeated. And a lot of times we get defeated in these areas. We become anxious. We become worried. We become ever been discouraged. Why are you, why do people get discouraged? You ever stop and think about that? What is the core of discouragement? Fear. Fear of what's going to happen in the future. How many of you remember, maybe some of you are too old or not old enough for this, but how many of you guys Remember how you used to predict the future when you were a kid? Do you remember that? Do you remember that special little tool? The magic eight ball. And as I was thinking about this message this week, I was like, I actually had to get online and order this because I was like, you know, so much of our lives are like a magic eight ball. God, should I marry so-and-so? <laughs> the future is uncertain. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. You know, God, should I uh, invest in something? It is decidedly so. <laughs> and you know what? The magic gate ball. Should I ask Johnny to go to prom with me? Ask again later. <laughs> and you know, we spent hours with the Magic 8 Ball on making different decisions, and there was no fear in the outcome. Maybe there was, like, oh, I don't want to ask him out. Oh, no. You know, and on all these things that the Magic 8 Ball would do for us. And you know, it's amazing how many generations this has been around. Um, still made by Mattel. This has been in production for longer than I've been, I think, around. So I would try to research and find out when it was invented. I don't, some of you that Google better than me can, can think of that. But the Magic 8-Ball used to tell it, take away worry and anxiety. Why? Because it gave you the answer. Or did it? Ask again later. What is that? And the Magic 8-Ball was the way that we would determine what we were going to do. Why? Because we don't know the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We can't impact the future. We can't shape and change the future. But there is somebody with you. If you're a Christian, there's somebody with you that knows the future. He holds the future where? In his hand. Now I do too. 
but mine is very limited. Mine is very limited in its scope and ability. But we have an eternal God who is with us. We have an eternal Christ who is with us. We have an eternal spirit who is with us in every situation, every circumstance, all the way to the very end of your life. How many of you know when you're going to die? God knows. I'm glad I don't know. How would you like to live your final week? You know, I'm glad that there's a God who knows and worries about these things, so I don't have to. But sometimes people still choose to. And and why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we? Well, because we're human. And because of this, God sent his son to redeem us to share with us his word so that we can too know that we have eternal life and we know we have a God who is sovereign over the events of man so that we don't have to worry, we don't have to fear, we don't have to get discouraged, we don't have to live in defeat because there are times and seasons in which God's going to grow us and things are going to get hard. Let me ask you a question. Do you change willingly or unwillingly? I can answer that. Humans don't like change, but we expect change, don't we? I don't see anybody walk in today with a baby bottle, which I'm glad for, although I'd argue some sport drink bottles aren't far from it. But nobody's walking around in diapers today, hopefully. Nobody's walking around with a pacifier around their neck because we change. And some of us don't want to change the changes that are happening, right? The older you get, the body breaks down, the brain works at full speed, body works at quarter speed, you know, and these things start to happen to us. And, 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 and we can't do what we used to do and we get frustrated, we get discouraged. But these are opportunities that God uses in our lives to grow us and stretch us and mold us into what he wants us to be and to shape our lives for the glory of God. And we're not going to do that usually willingly. How do we know that? Try to make a decision for Jesus this morning. Make it public to everybody. Well, I don't want to do that. Then they'll hold me accountable. (laughs) Change. We're afraid of change. We're afraid of being held accountable. We're afraid of failure. We're afraid of not being able to do the task at hand. What if I were to tell you today, the Bible doesn't just say that God is with you. It actually says that everything I just described that you can't do, God already has. God is with you. God is for you. And if God is with you and God is for you, who can stand against you? And I'm going to show you three places in the Bible in which this is very accurate, very true. You can go back and mine these out for yourselves. But to this point, We've talked through very practical ways in which you can overcome fear, which you can deal with fear. Recognizing there is good and bad, right? There's good fear and there's bad fear. Recognizing that we can throw and cast all our cares on Jesus Christ because he cares for us. The place for our fear fear is to be in the hands of Jesus Christ. We give that to him. Add to it the spirit of self-discipline that God has given us, and we start to think that It's actually conceivable that we can overcome fear. And now today, I want you to understand that it's not just conceivable, but it is the expectation of God for us not to fear. How many times when an angel showed up to somebody in the Bible, what were the first two words out of the angel's mouth? Why? Because you can overcome it. You can overcome it. They were scared at the presence of an angel, would you be surprised if an angel showed up in your room today? When you're by yourself, an angel just poof, or walks through the wall, or whatever, because they, I, I would be afraid. I'm not going to lie to you. I'd be afraid. I'd be a little worried. But then if they told me to fear not, God sent me, what would we do? Whew. Okay, now I'm scared again. What is he going to tell me? Right? Right? And see how quick we gravitate towards fear? We're afraid of what? We're afraid of the future. We're afraid of the unknown. But what if I told you the future and the unknown are already known? Because the one who's with you already knows it. 
So why worry about the things that are foreordained for, for you to do and for you to say and for you to go places and do things? Why not just trust God and do it with joy? Which is what he wants for us. So this is where Jesus comes in and reminds us that we are not alone in this present age. You are not doing life by yourself. And by the way, you don't have to have other humans to do life together either. Now, is fellowship important? Sure. But if you are all by yourself, is God enough? Is Jesus Christ enough? Is his spirit enough? Absolutely. So while we have the fellowship of believers, that's great. But that's not the end game for God. The end game for God is that you trust him in all areas of your life. Remember the psalmist, we were reading through Psalm 56 there, and he's worried about the enemies, he's worried about the people surrounding him, but then he remembers one fact. Do you remember what the one fact was in Psalm 56? God is with me, and in him I will trust. And this is where we got to get to in this fear category. This is where we got to get to. When COVID hit and everybody's fearful... You know what, Christians, we should have stood stronger. We should have stood out because who controls the events of man? God. Why aren't Ukrainian believers fearful today? Why are they singing in subway stations? Why are they going to church? Why are they doing those things? Because they have a second supernatural indwelling of the Holy Spirit that comes at war. Said nowhere in the Bible ever. You know what they have? They have an absence of fear because can they control the bombs? Who does? Not Vladimir Putin. God controls where they land. God controls what happens in the world today. You say, well, man has his influence. Sure, under the authority of God. Do we need to run back to Job from last week, which I tried to make Jonah? We can run back to Job. And, and Satan could do everything to Job but one thing. You can't touch him. can't touch his body. All right, I'll let you touch his body. You can't kill him. And what was Satan limited to? That very thing. Satan is not all powerful. God is. Let me show you Joshua in the promised land. Let's let's read this passage real quick here in John, though, before we get into that. So I I want to look at John chapter 16 and verse 33. John chapter 16 and verse 33, it's Jesus here is speaking and he's talking to the Father. And he's talking to the Father in essence of about his glory. And in John 16 and verse 33, the Bible says, I have said these things to you that in me you can have, say it together. How many have peace this morning? How many don't have peace? Because you're anxious. You're worried. You're afraid. I said these things so that you may have peace. In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. But take heart. Be of confidence. Understand this. I have what? Overcome the world. So Jesus has overcome the world. These are his words. It's read in your Bible. If you look in your Bible, they're red words. Take heart. Who's overcome the world? Jesus Christ. In this world, what are you going to have? Good times or problems? Tribulation. That kind of messes with the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, doesn't it? This is who saying we're going to have problems in the world? Jesus. Ukrainian believers, are they having their best life now? No. You know when they're going to have their best life? In heaven. But now what they're going to have is faithfulness. Perseverance steadfastness, faith, patience, temperance. By the way, what are all those? They're all fruits of the Spirit. And they're living in a, in a nation that's not free. They're living in a nation that's under attack. And yet they're in church. They have confidence. They're afraid, but not afraid. 
They don't know what the future is for their country. They don't know what the future is for their livelihood. They don't know what their provision is going to be for the future. But you know what? I can control what? This is last week's message. I can control today. And today, I'm going to glorify God. Today, I'm going to trust God. Today, I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to worship Him. I'm going to do the things that God's called me to do today because why? God's going to give me today what I need for today. And they know that their God is with them whithersoever they go. You say, well, they must have some more like better theological training than we do or something over there to do this no you know what they're under tribulation who said that we would go through tribulation who said we would have hard times and what does god use as a press or as a mold to shape his people to find out who's real and who's not tribulation It's through trials that we find out what we really believe about God. It's through trials that we come forth as gold, tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times, as the Word of God tells us, that that process by which a, a goldsmith draws the dross off the gold to purify it, and he has to do it through flame and through pressure. Now I want you to take your Bible and go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, because the children of Israel were no strangers to tribulation in this world. You and I are not going to be strangers to tribulation in this world. Last week, I briefly talked about the spies. Remember them in Numbers chapter 13 and 14? And in the middle of the story, a young man named Joshua was there. And um, you'll recognize his name as we... um, as we read the passage of scripture here, that he was the one to succeed Moses in the leadership of Israel. And he is to take God's people into the promised land. And 40 years earlier, it is Caleb and who that goes into the promised land. This is the same Joshua. Joshua and Caleb who went in, they saw the spy, or they were the spies. They saw the giants. They saw the walls. They saw everything that was there. And let's read Joshua chapter one, verses one through five here. It says this. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the promised land that I'm giving them to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given it to you just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness, to this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as it was with Moses, so will it be with you. I will not leave you, nor say it together. Who is with them? God is. And God is saying, you can do these extraordinary things, Because, number one, I'm telling you, you can. And number two, I've given you the power to do it. And because you have the ability and you have the power, look down at verse 9 now. Joshua 1, 9, have not I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you. How, How far? Wherever you go. Now, if this was true, the children of Israel, in their day, has God changed? And is God still with his people wherever they go? And if you're a Christian here today, you say, well, I'm not a Jew. I'm not the children of Israel. True. But if you're a Christian, what are you? You're a child of God. It's a little better than being a child of Israel. You're in the family of God. And if you're in the family of God, what does God promise to never do? He promised to never leave you, nor... You know what? The God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New Testament. Because the God that wouldn't leave or forsake Joshua is the same God that will never leave or forsake you. And if that is true, there's probably more that we can build on this then. So we can be not terrified... We can be not dismayed, 
Even the great Joshua, the son of Nun, who led the Israelites to safety into the promised land, was reminded by God himself not to fear. Now, what does that tell you man is prone to doing? The natural state of man is to want to worry and fear, not have faith. So now what does that tell us about faith a little bit? That it's going to take something outside the ordinary to succeed in this. The Hebrews tells us that without faith, or faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not knowing all the details and then trusting God. Faith is trusting God that he has all the details. And without faith, it's impossible for us to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So there's work in faith. We have to work in our faith. We have to maintain our faith. We have to imagine getting in an airliner to fly somewhere in Russia today where they can't get parts and they haven't done maintenance on their jets. If you don't maintain an airliner, what happens? It gets better. Evolution proves it. Things work from worse to better, right? No. Things work from organization and working to complete chaos. And if you can't maintain an aircraft, what is the natural outcome of that? At some part, parts are going to disappear. Parts are going to fail. Things are going to happen, and you end up in destruction. You've got to maintain faith. Faith is something we maintain. How do we maintain faith? What's it called theologically? It's called sanctification. It's called the process of becoming more like God and learning about God, who he is, what he's like, and what he does. And when we know those things, we get confidence in the Lord. When we get confidence, our faith increases. So this is what the Bible is telling us, that our faith will increase as we surrender these areas to God. Let's look no further than Jesus and the disciples now, shall we? Let's jump to the New Testament. We saw Joshua in the Old Testament. Let's jump to Jesus with his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, look at verse 20. Great commission here, so not an unfamiliar passage of Scripture for us. But he says, Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, or lo, I am with you always, even to when? When is always? Where does always not apply? So in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, the very end, the very last verse of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gives his disciples a final commission and an exhortation that he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How terrified were the disciples thinking about the fact that Jesus, their leader, who was crucified, and he rose again, he's been visible for the last period of weeks, and now he's going to ascend in front of us, he's going to leave us, and what do you think their anxiety level was? What do you think their disappointment level was? What do you think their confidence level is? We can't do this, Jesus. I mean, you, you got to be here. When you're here, we're strong. And when you're gone, <laughs> we went fishing. We went back to ordinary life. We hid in the upper room. We, we weren't doing great things for you. So, Jesus, you've got to stay with us because if you're with us, man, who can stand against us? So the disciples had to be terrified thinking that sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in a world that was hostile to it. Matter of fact, Jesus himself was killed for what reason? Saying he was the Christ. Saying he was the king of the Jews. And now here these 12 guys or 11 guys, then they add Matthias back in in Acts 1, uh, it, these guys got to go out and preach what? The very thing Jesus was killed for. In the same people, in the same culture, in the same climate he was crucified in. So you think there was anxiety or no anxiety? Think there was some fear or no fear? I would argue with you there was fear. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have said the last phrase. And I am with you always. What are they questioning? If you leave Jesus, who's with us? He says, I'm with you. 
I am with you always to the end of the age. Quote Napoleon Dynamite, always and forever. How terrified the disciples had to be that Jesus would say this. Has the truth changed all these years? Where is Jesus today? Is he still with his believers? Is he still for them? Is he still making intercession for them? Has the Holy Spirit come that is just like him as he said he would? And is he not dwelling and indwelling the believers? Is he not convicting of sin and empowering people to do extraordinary things for God? Absolutely. Jesus is alive. He's with us. And he's right where he said he'd be. Now, let me go to the third group. The third group of people is Jesus and you. You see, Jesus was Joshua in the Old Testament. Jesus was with his disciples in the New Testament. But what about after the Testaments? What about after the disciples are gone? Is Jesus with his believers today? Well, this is where John 16 comes back into play. Let's go back there. John chapter 16. He was incredibly honest with his disciples when he was leaving them. Jesus was extremely honest and open to them. He said, you're going to have fear, but don't worry about fear. Don't worry about what they can do. I am greater. I will be with you. And even when they didn't like the truth or they couldn't understand it, they always could count on the unvarnished truth that Jesus did what he said he would do. They had the confidence. They spent time with him. They knew him. So now let's look at the chapter of John here where Jesus is talking in chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. Now we'll put them together. It says this, Behold, the hour is coming, and indeed has come, when you will be scattered. Now does that sound like maybe or confident? You are going to be scattered. You're going to be separated from each other. Each to his own home. And will leave me alone Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. After Jesus' arrest, his eventual death, the disciples did scatter. They scattered all over the Roman Empire and the world. Many of them went back to their own homes. But then there's an interesting point that he told them that <clears throat> they wouldn't be alone and that Jesus wouldn't be alone, but that his Father, God, would still be with him, Jesus Christ. The disciples did to Jesus exactly what he promised never to do to him. And that's they left him. Man scattered when he didn't know the future. Jesus, who knew the future, knew what? Their father was with him wherever he went. So when Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane that night, and he prayed, Lord, let this cup pass from me, what was he really praying for? It wasn't that he couldn't die on a cross for the sin of man. That's the reason he came to earth. The reason he wants the cup to pass is because something is going to occur in the Godhead that has never occurred in the history of the Godhead. And for a period of three days, the son is not going to know the future. He's not going to have the fellowship with God and he has to trust God the Father to bring him through. When has that ever happened in the history of the Godhead? So Jesus facing this proposition, knowing the Father is with him wherever he goes, Jesus himself has to put faith in the Father and trust his will. This is why Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because he knows what it's like. He's experienced himself. Do you remember when he was hanging on the cross, he yells out, Eli, Eli, lava sabachthani. What does that mean? My God, my God, why have you... There's where it happened. Right there, at that moment, that's when it happened. And God the Father turns his back and darkness falls on the face of the earth and all the sin of mankind is placed on the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the... Sins of the world. And what does light have with darkness? And in that moment, Jesus was all alone because the Father turned his back. Fellowship was broken because of your sin and my sin. And that caused a separation in the Godhead. But praise the Lord, three days later, what happened? 
The stone is rolled away. Jesus Christ comes forth and he ascends into the presence of the Father and the Father receives his Son just like the prodigal son was received in the Old Testament as a picture of what's to come with Christ. Jesus Christ, after carrying the sin of mankind, is welcomed into the presence of the Father and he shows them his hands, he shows them his side, he shows them his feet and he says, they have been bought with a price, they are mine. No longer are they outside and need a sheep to redeem them. Now they have redemption through the Lamb of God. And they can be my brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be part of the family of God. In the world, you're going to have trouble. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. By the way, the, by the, way, the word trouble is also defined in Strong's Dictionary as affliction, tribulation, oppression, distress. It generally describes the pressure and the pressing together of something. Remember I said that God molds us and shapes us? When you use a mold, what do you need? You need pressure. You need pressure to push the mold together, to force out the air, to force out the impurities. And when you get that mold pressed together and you hold it together and it sets and then you release the mold, what do you end up with? The image of the mold. God uses tribulation and pressure in our lives to fashion and shape us after the image of Jesus Christ. Now, wouldn't, there be, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a verse that said that? Wouldn't it be great if there was a verse in the Bible that says that God uses trials and tribulation and pressure to mold us and shape us after the image and likeness of God? I think there's a couple of them, isn't there? We could run to James. We could run to Romans. We could run to a lot of places where this concept is clearly seen as well here in John chapter 16. In other words, you could say this. In this world, you're going to have pressures and afflictions, oppression and distress placed upon you so that I, God, can form you and fashion you in my likeness and in my ways. Has God done that in your life? Have there been times where God's applied the pressure to get you to be like him? The real pressure is in this life right now. Whatever trouble, distress is yet to come, we, we can celebrate Jesus Christ. We can overcome the world because of Jesus Christ, but it's hard to celebrate day by day. It's hard to have confidence every day when the trials and tribulations just keep coming, right? And you survive one, and then what's your thought? Oh, man, what's tomorrow going to be like? Or maybe you're just in a bad run of trials. Maybe God is, you know, maybe you're in a Job-like situation. I mean, think about Job. It was good, 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 and then it went bad, and how long did it go bad? It was a streak. It was, it was, it was a trial. It was hard. And it was, he was losing all kinds of stuff in his life. But I love what verse 33 reminds us. However real the pressure, God has overcome the world. Look at this verse. I have said these things to you, that in me you will have peace. You can have peace. You may. You will have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If Christ is an overcomer, what are the odds that you can be an overcomer too? If Jesus Christ said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, what are the odds that you can be an overcomer too? We don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to be afraid. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how impossible the odds our God is bigger. Our God is stronger. There might be giants on the horizon, but they're nothing to a God who already knows the, how the victory is going to be won. Now, I don't know about you, but when you study out that passage of Scripture and they go into Jericho and they're looking at these walls and they're looking at these things, the last way I ever would have thought to beat those walls would be to march around at one time a day for six days and on the seventh day walk around at seven times, blow some trumpets and see what happens. Just saying. How many of you, that would be your battle strategy? What worked? That battle strategy. Whose battle strategy was it? Man's or God's? And you know what? When we let God be God and we just be obedient, guess what happens? He takes the crazy things, he takes the simple things of the world and confounds the wise, and he takes the crazy things and makes them believable. 
That's what God does. We stand with the one who has already overcome, the one who chooses to stand with us until the very end of time. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When Jesus added to the habits that we've already been building, to the habits we've already been forming, when we add Jesus Christ to the mix throughout this series, we become like Paul and more like Paul in the way that he says things. I want you to look at Philippians chapter 4 now. Remember this verse? The most misquoted verse, I think, in our generation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to jump off this mountain and my parachute's going to come out and I'm going to sail down there and break a Guinness World Record because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I like the coffee cup. I can do all things through a verse misquoted and out of context. Right? You ever see that mug? It's not what this verse means. It's not the context in which it's in either. If you try to apply that statement or that thought process to this passage of scripture, it's like trying to read a novel and ending with a comic book. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. But when you know that the Savior of the universe is committing to standing with you through every trial, every season, every affliction, and literally everything that comes up in front of you as an obstacle to your faith, What will Jesus do? Every time your faith is challenged, every time your faith is pushed, every time the mold is being smashed on your faith, what did Jesus Christ say he would give you? The strength to go through it. So I can go through any trial, I can go through any temptation, even to the point of death, Because who's my strength? Me or God? Why was it the rulers couldn't break the will of the disciples in their time? Remember James and John when they're told, don't go out and preach. And they look at the rulers of the city and they say, we can't help but preach. What do you mean don't preach? Right? Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4. What do you mean don't preach? All we do is preach. If you put us in jail, guess what we're going to do? We're going to preach. Paul. Paul's like, I don't, I'm not afraid of you, Herod. I'm not afraid of what you can do to me. I'm not, I don't, I'm not you know, I'm a Roman. I appeal to Rome. Send me to Rome. I ain't, I ain't even going to waste my time with you anymore. I'm a Roman citizen. Send me to Rome. You got no power over me, man. It's Ukrainian believers today, why are they doing what they're doing? Because God gives us strength in the midst of trials to overcome whatever obstacle we're facing. You realize that there is not a temptation that you're ever going to have in your life that God does not strengthen you to overcome it. That's his promise. So whatever fear, whatever trial, whatever tribulation you find yourself in, number one, thank God for the trial because he's about to do something big in your life. Number two, tell God you're afraid, you're worried, you're anxious, you're, you're fearful. Number three, do what? thank God again for what he's going to do. And then number four, what do we do? We trust him. Remember, thank, tell, thank, trust. Look at Philippians chapter four here. In Philippians chapter four, Paul is demonstrating this for us. Back, back up to verse number 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at length I have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be what? To be content, to be thankful, for I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. He's been through tribulation. He's been through trials. He's had opposition against him. Verse 11, not that I'm speaking and being of need, for I've learned in whatsoever situation I am to be content, to be thankful. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and and of facing hunger, of abundance and need. What do those sound like? Trials and tribulation, good times and bad times. And throughout the good times and the bad times, 
I can do all things through who? Through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, the trial isn't the issue. It's the trust. The, the, the strength isn't a problem because God's going to give the strength to go through the trial. The problem is, do you trust God the same when you have much as when you have nothing? When things are good as when things are bad. When you have an abundance and when you have nothing. When you can control it and when you can't control it. In all those situations, in all those time periods, regardless of what your perception is of what's going on in your life, is God with you? And if he's with you, then what's the answer? Nothing can stand against you. That's the meaning of this verse. It's not that I can be a super basketball player or soccer player or I can do some extraordinary thing. I can go through any trial and any point of life with pure confidence in God. Why? Because I know he'll strengthen me and he'll be with me wherever I go. This is the confidence of the believer. This is the hope of the believer. This is why we don't fear. We put fear in its proper place. We put it in God's lap. God, your problem, not mine, right? Call unto me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't know, that you don't comprehend. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And he'll what? He'll make your path straight. He'll direct your path. He'll straighten out the kinks. It's not fear, anxiety, worry, and doubt. It's not that they don't exist. It's that they have their proper place. And their place is for us to have them in our hands handing them over to a holy God and say, God, not my problems. These are your problems. God, not my will, but these, the, I want your will. The, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know the resources for this, God. But you know what, God? Here they are. They're yours. Put it in the lap of God, number one. Number two, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Why? Christ is with us. He's with you wherever you go. You don't have to be discouraged. The almighty creator of everything out of nothing has your problem. So thank him, tell him, thank him, trust him. That's all we got to do. That's all we can do. The only things that we can control. God and Jesus are with you always, even to the end of the world. Right to the very end of your life. And even after your life, guess what? God and Jesus are still there. And even after the next life, God and Jesus are still there. You know why? Because God supersedes three things. Time, space, and matter. What matters to you doesn't matter to God. So you can give it all to him. Cast all your fear, all your anxiety on him. And then he promised this statement. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when can you trust Jesus Christ with your problems? Today. Right now. All day today. You can cast all your cares. Guess what you can do to him tomorrow? Cast all your cares. Guess what you can do a week from now? Cast all your cares. But guess what you can't do? You can't throw your fears tomorrow on Christ tomorrow. You've got to do it today. Give us this day our daily bread. Provide for me today what I need. You know what? We don't need a magic eight ball to tell us what the future is going to be. I'm glad I don't know the future. I'm glad when I was 10, I didn't know I'd live in freezing cold Minnesota. I probably would have, like, tried to rebel. I'd be, I would have been Jonah then. I'd try to go to Hawaii or something. I don't know. My Nineveh. But you know what? I don't need a magic eight ball. I got God. I don't need to worry about what the future is going to be. I got God. I don't need to worry. I don't need other things to preoccupy my time when I can trust God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings, but in every way. What does it mean in every way to acknowledge God? In every way, give it to God. In all your ways, give it to God. You're worried about it, give it to God. You know what? You're worried about it, you can give it to your friends first with a magic eight ball, but in the end, guess who you're really going to end up asking? God. So why not go right to him? Why go tell everybody else first? Tell God. You have not because you... 
Maybe there's a problem. God, I, I, I know you don't care about my fear. No, he very much cares about your fear. He very much cares about what you worry about. And he wants to be your God, amen? And he is our God. And he's an all-powerful God. And he's an all-loving all God. And he's a very ever-present God with us. So what? you know what? If we have that, who can stand against that? Satan can't. The angels can't. You and I can't. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what? I want to do it willingly and for my master and savior. Give it to him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior, the first thing you can give to him is your life. Surrender. Not my will, God, your will. Because you can never have victory in Jesus Christ unless you're part of the family in Jesus Christ. You don't have the spirit of God living inside you. You have the spirit of God fighting against you. And as he fights and wars against you, it's a spiritual war, you're never going to win. However, I love the, the conjunct, conjunction in the Bible, but God, right? But God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, be eternally separated from God, but should have everlasting life. He that has the son has life. He that does not have the son does not have life. So the Bible is very clear that if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart Jesus Christ, we can be saved. Not just that Jesus Christ existed, but that Jesus Christ did what? He lived a perfect life. He died a sinless death. He was buried and he resurrected the third day according to the scriptures. And because of his perfection, because he was the perfect lamb of God, he could take away the sin of the world. And in the process of taking away sin, guess what also he gave us? the privilege of eternal life in his family. And the book of life is all about the family tree. And if your name is written in the book of life, you're in the family tree, you get into heaven. If your name's not in the book of life, you're an illegitimate child, you're not part of the family, you don't get the rights and you don't get the privileges of the family. You don't have the name. And that's what's going to happen one day when every knee and every tongue... And every person appears before Jesus Christ. The Christians are going to appear at a different judgment. And God's going to judge us how we use the time in this world for his glory. When we gave him glory and we, we used his glory well, and how we robbed God of his glory. And at that point, there'll be rewards given, and then we'll give them back to the Lord anyway. But for the rest, they stand before a different judgment. A great white throne judgment. And at that judgment, sinners are judged according to their sin. How many sins does it take to miss heaven? For by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so sin passed upon all men for all sin. What is the proof that every person's a sinner? How many are getting younger? The wage of sin is, there it is. The fact that every human being on earth today has the ability to die and is working towards death is proof of God's word. So, you don't have to die and be eternally separated from God. You can die and have everlasting life. And it's, it's available through his son. Magic 8 ball can't save you. Can't even get you a girlfriend. Can't, can't even get you a car, for crying out loud. The future's unclear. But you know who it's very clear with? Jesus Christ. He said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And you can do all things when I empower you through the trials and tribulations of this world, I, you can do all things when I have it. When you put it in my hands, I will give you the strength to go through whatever situation you are facing. You don't have to fear. You can have confidence in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that it's quick, it's powerful. Thank you that it's understandable and that we can read it, we can study it, and we can know exactly what it says. And Father, you don't have to have a special enlightenment. There's not a, a special second anything that we need to get. It's available to us as normal believers, everyday people that want to follow you and serve you and glorify you. We can pick up the Bible and we can see exactly what your plan for our life is. And Father, I pray that we would be students of the word. I pray that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God workmen that don't need to be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. 
And Father, I thank you that your word promises that you will never leave us, you'll never forsake us. I thank you for the knowledge of knowing that we can have eternal life. These are written that you might know that you have eternal life, First John says. And Father, I pray today that if there's somebody watching this on video, or maybe they end up uh, here in the auditorium and they're here this morning and they don't know you as Savior, Father, I pray that, that you would give them the peace that passes all understanding in knowing that they're a child of God. Understanding that getting saved doesn't get you away from tribulation and trials, but it gives reason for the tribulation and trials so that you can put us in your mold and you can press us and shape us and mold us into what you want us to be. Like that Play-Doh and all the molds as kids play with today and make so many different creations and, and wondrous things out of clay. Father, you are the potter and we are the clay and you mold us and shape us into what you want us to be for your glory. Father, if there's some here today who are paralyzed by fear, the future, decisions, Father, I pray that they would get on their knees some point and just give it to you. Surrender it to you. Cast all their care on you because you care for them. And Father, when we let go and let you be God and we stop trying to be God and stop trying to figure out everything in our life, it is so freeing. It is so liberating that now, Father, we can go through the world and we can look for opportunities to be a blessing to others. We don't have to focus on ourselves. We don't have to try to self-preserve ourselves. We can live free in this world and not be afraid of dying one second before the time we're supposed to die because, Father, you have that even in your hands. So, Father, help us to, help us to understand the time we live in. Help us understand the ministry you have given to us. And then, Father, let us go boldly into all the world and proclaim the gospel because lo, you are with us always, even to the end of the world. And Lord, may we do it for your glory and for the good of others. In your name we pray, all God's people said.